Okay, welcome to another Ginger Mathematician video. Today is a little bit different to what I've done before, and that is I am going to go through a Cambridge IGCSE paper in complete detail. So I'm going to start with the paper two. I'm going to go through every single question on the paper and the thought process in going through it. And I will highlight for particular questions what uh, keyword you need to put into Google or your favorite search engine to then find extra practice questions on that topic. Okay, so this is a non-calculated paper. It's called the paper two on Cambridge International Mathematics 0607. And this is the 2.3 version of the paper. So let's get started straight away, straight down into question one, like so. So this would come under coordinate geometry. So if I can just write that for you, I'll pop it down there in a moment. So this would be considered under the coordinate geometry topic, like so. Okay, so for the first question, write down the equation of line L. Now that's this line here. Now with vertical lines, it's always going to be x equals something. Our key point here is minus three. Therefore, our answer to that particular question is x equals minus three. Now you're probably wondering why. Why not y equals minus three? Why not x equals minus three? Well, that's because every coordinate on this particular line has an x coordinate of minus three. So for example, if I take this coordinate up here, well, this one here would be brackets minus three, four, close brackets, this coordinate just there. Uh, if I take another coordinate, say down here, oops, I don't want to highlight anything. Um, if I say this coordinate, that helps if I press the right buttons. It's not liking it here. Okay, so this coordinate is minus three, minus two, down here. So each of these coordinates share minus three as the x coordinates, therefore we have x equals minus three. Okay, well the coordinate of the point of intersection that phrase there, point of intersection like so, basically means where they meet, i.e. this point here. And I think we can see nice and clearly, it be along the corridor, minus three, and up the stairs, two. Therefore, we get the coordinates of minus three, comma, two, like so. Okay, so far so good. Now we need to find the gradient of line M as soon as you see that keyword gradient, and quite a few people forget this, it means then we need to do our main formula for working it out. So that's going to be gradient is equal to the rise divided by the run. Okay, well, what does that mean in theory? Well, if we take two points, so if we take this point here, and we take this point here, and we draw a right angle triangle coming down from that point and going across ways like that. So you can do this at any point on the line. I've chosen this for simplicity. Now the rise, the height of that, well that's one, and the run going along here is two. So the gradient is rise over run, therefore the gradient, which I'm gonna use M for gradient, is equal to one over two. And that gets you the first mark. The second mark, well, look at the line itself. Is it going downwards from left to right or upwards from left to right? Well, we can see the line is going downwards, Therefore, it is going to be negative minus a half. And that's our answer there. So two things to remember. Rise over run for gradient. And then remember the minus sign 
because it's a downward slope of the particular line. Remember, this topic is called coordinate geometry. So if you want to do more research on that, that's what to look for. Now our second question is the highest common factor of these two numbers. Now you could do a Venn diagram and a factor tree, but it's only one mark and there's a much more straightforward way of doing it. The first step is to write all the factors of the different numbers themselves. So for example, is it going to be cooperative? I sincerely hope so. Yeah, there's definitely settings I want. So first of all, we need to work out 60 and what the factors are. So you can go through these and start with one and then two, three, and so on. However, there is a quicker way of doing this. If you look at the two numbers, the first number you probably think that goes into both is six. And you can check that using the bus stop division or going through your times tables. But you should never always stop at six and think, ah, six is a common factor, but is it the highest? So then we think, okay, what can I multiply six by by the smallest number? So I should probably check 12, 18, and 24 to see if those numbers also go into 96 and 60. Well, 12 goes into 65 times, and 12 goes into 96 eight times. So that also works. 18 doesn't go into 60, so we can forget that, and 24 also doesn't go into 60, so we can forget that. So 12 must be our answer. Again, you could write out all the common factors and find the highest one, but a little bit of common sense goes quite a long way in that kind of question. Okay, if you want to do any research on that, that's under highest common factor. And likewise for question three, this phrase expand and simplify, you see that quite a lot. That will come under algebra, first of all. Not being very cooperative today, I do not know why. There is probably a reason for it. Yep, that's definitely the font I want to use. I definitely want to write some text. So you want to look under algebra, expand and simplify, if you actually want to look at more of these kind of questions. Now the first thing we need to do is expand the bracket using the hook. So let's go through that. And I'll move that to oh, my lovely text box. Let's just start off with 10x and move it across. So 5 times 2x is 10x. Ooh. OK, and 5 times 3y, well, that will give you plus, span it out slightly, plus 15y. So what we're doing here is we're multiplying each part of the bracket out using what I like to call the hook. So you multiply that bit together, and then you multiply the 5 by that part there. So 5 times 2x is 10x, 5 times 3y is 15y. And we do the same process for the minus 3. But notice we have a minus 3 here, not a plus 3. So that changes some of the calculations that we do somewhat. So minus 3 times 4y, well that will give me That will give me minus 12y. And the most important part to remember here, minus 3 times minus 2x is plus 6x. So that's an important thing to remember, that minus times a minus gives you a plus. It's the biggest mistake made on these kind of questions. Now we just collect up the x's. So 10x plus 6x is 16x. 15y minus 12y. Well, that's equal to 3y, like so. And this doesn't factorise at all. So the final answer will be 16x minus 3y. If you want to do more practice on that, look under Algebra, Expand and Simplify.
Okay, moving on. So question four, this is a fact you simply need to know off by heart. Anything to the power of zero is equal to one. So the answer is just one. Okay, um, I have done a video on this on my YouTube channel, but this is a fact you simply need to remember, that if you have anything to the power of zero, it's equal to one, hence one mark. Now this question here, this is called a substitution question, also under algebra, so I'll put algebra there as well. So if you want more practice on this, this is called substitution and algebra. And we want to find V when U is 30 and F is 10. So we need to work out that there. So our first step is to work out the numerator and denominator separately. Now, if you've got U, F next to each other, that means 30 times 10. So that will be our numerator. And the denominator of the fraction, well, that's U minus F. So that's going to be 30 minus 10. So we do these separately. Remember, the fractions, you do them separately. So 30 times 10 is 300. 30 minus 10 is equal, oops, there we are, e equal to 20. And then finally, we do 300, our numerator, divided by 20. Well, that's going to be equal to 15. So our answer there is 15. So remember, whenever you're substituting into a fraction, you do the numerator and denominator separately, and then you can work out your answer. Now, question six was a kind of funny question for IGCSE, but you just have to use a little bit of what I call mathematical common sense. So, we're looking to find a fraction, n, that satisfies the inequality. That is between five sevenths and six sevenths, but not equal to either of them. Now, the easiest way to go about this is to use equivalent fractions from year seven. So, five sevenths, well, if we times top and bottom, by 2, we'll get 10 at the top and 14 at the bottom, Ooh. like so. And the inequality stays the same, so is less than or equal to n, I'm going to write over the question now, which is less than or equal to, well, we're going to do the same trick times 2 top and bottom, that gives us 12 over 14 and now we actually have a fraction that's between 10 over 14 and 12 over 14 that is 11 over 14 the fraction halfway between them so that will be the correct answer there like so so the answer is 11 over 14 now the second question you have to use a little bit more imagination mathematically speaking so we want an irrational number, keyword, that satisfies the inequality that this irrational number is between four and seven. Now, unfortunately, pi doesn't work. That's 3.14159. That's a bit of a shame. Otherwise, that would be an easy question. So we need to think of the other irrational numbers we have seen. And this should be a familiar word to you, thirds are what we're going to have to use instead. So we're going to do a similar process to 6a, but we're going to convert them into root numbers. Notice I didn't say thirds, but root numbers. So 4 is the same as the square root of 16. That is supposed to be a 16. Hmm, doesn't like it. And that's obviously the lower bound of m, and the 7 can be written as the square root of 49, like so. So we want an irrational number between the square root of 16 and the square root of 49. And we can choose any number between 16 and 49 as long as it's not a perfect square, 25 or 36. So for example, not the only answer. I do want a 2. 
I want the square root of 20. That would be fine. Uh, if you look at the mark scheme, like so, I'm sure it will give many different answers here. Um, yeah, any irrational number within the range, so as long as a is not 25 or 36. That's the key thing to remember. Yeah, you could have 2 pi. Actually, that's quite an interesting idea. Just multiply 3.1459 by 2. That also works too. Excellent. Okay, so we're on to another question here. I don't want the mark scheme. Um, we are having now a look at question 7. So this is essentially a vector question. I certainly would describe it as such. So if you want more information on this, it's under vectors. Quite straightforward vectors. It's not a vector algebra. Just understanding your understanding of basic vectors. So Q is the point 3, 7, and P to Q is minus 6, 3. Find the coordinates of P. So I would kind of do this backwards. I know what the coordinates of Q are. So if I do a little sketch, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's better. A little sketch. Now 3, 7 will be 3 along and 7 up. So that will be not that really, really small. Not that small. That small. 3, 7 will come up. If I can grab this. No, don't want to grab. Yeah, there we are. 3, 7 will be up here somewhere. Now, the vector minus 6, 3, well, that is 6 to the left and 3 up. So we want to go from to actual vector, sorry, coordinates of P. So we start at Q. We know the vector PQ is going 6 left and 3 down. So the vector that we're interested in, that's it, uh, is the vector QP. It wants to make everything into a lovely shape. So the vector QP, there we are. Going the other direction is we simply flip over the signs. That is, we get 6 and minus 3. Well, 6, there we are, big 6. 6 and minus 3. That is 6 to the right and 3 down. Because we want to start at Q and end up at P. So the 6 to the right, that's going to change this coordinate. So that's going to become 9. Ah, there we are. That's going to become 9, which is turned into a very weird shape. I'm going to just going to write it by text, so I think it's a bit easier. Right, so our first coordinate is 9. Because we take 3 and we're going 6 to the right, that makes 9. And then if we take this coordinate, the 7, we're going to go 3 downwards, and that gives us 4. So the coordinate is 9, 4. So it's just an understanding of PQ, well, we want to go the other direction, we want to go QP, and therefore we can work it out. Um, this here means, it's this word you need to be familiar with, the magnitude. So we're looking for the magnitude of this vector here. So the vector PQ, which is minus 6, 3. Now to work out the magnitude, we always do the same process each and every time. So first of all, we are going to draw uh, a right angle triangle. Okay, so let's draw, I don't want that, I want a line, that's it. Right angle triangle, and then finally we connect up our triangle like so, and we're told we are going 6 to the left and then 3 up. Therefore that means if we do it in terms of vectors, so you start on here, we go 6 to the left, so that's our 6, and then we go 3 up like that. So 6 to the left and 3 up, and what we're trying to find is the 
magnitude of the vector, i.e. the length of this line here. And it already gives you a hint in the question that we need to write the answer in simplest third form. So that should trigger an idea of, okay, right angle triangle, we want the length of the hypotenuse, we want to use some trigonometry. So we do our standard trigonometry practice, that is, we do the square root, so I'm going to put uh, square root, so we want the square root, so let's start again. So first of all, we want to do 3 squared, and that's equal to 9. We do 6 squared, and that's equal to 36. Move that up here. And then because we're looking for the hypotenuse, we add those two answers together. Remember, this is a non-calculated paper, so you need to work out all this by yourself. 36 plus 9 is 45. And then finally, we want the square root of that, so we get the square root of 45, like so. However, we're not finished because it wants it in simplest form. There are three marks to the question. What we've done so far is maybe one or two marks worth, but we want to simplify the square root of 45. So we need to think of the numbers that go into 45 to help us try and simplify it. So what two numbers multiply to give you 45 where one of them is a square number? I'll give you five seconds to have a think. Okay, well you should have got the idea that this is equal to the square root of 5 times the square root of 9. Just doing those funny nines again. Okay, so square root of 5 times the square root of 9. We know the square root of 9 is 3, therefore our answer is going to be 3. That comes from this, and then we put the root 5 afterwards, like so. So our answer is 3 root 5. You need to have that final answer to get all three marks on that question. If you like more work on this, look under vectors and particularly magnitude of vectors. That's the topic to look for. Okay, moving on. So we've got a standard form question here where we are minusing them without a calculator. And it does come up from time to time on the IGCSE paper. Now, one way you could do this, I've seen people do this, is you simply write at numbers 0 0.0000056 and then minus them, but that takes you far too long in the exam. We need a quicker method to do this. Now, the way I suggest to do this is follows, that if we take this part of our standard form, if you times by something and then divide by something, you still keep the same number. So I'm going to use that trick for this last part. I'm going to divide this part by 10, and I'm going to times that part by 10. So I'm going to times this by 10. Oh, go over here. Ah, what's it doing? There we are. So I'm going to times. I want to write 10. I don't want to fiddle around with this all the time. Right, times. There we are. So, times by 10 on that side, and I'm going to divide by 10 on that side. So, divide by 10 this, and times by 10 this. And then you'll see why I've gone to the effort of doing this. So, 7.8 divided by 10, well, that's the same as 0.78. If I times this side by 10, or is known as 10 to the power of 1, well, I'm going to increase this minus 8 by 1, which then gives me times 10, do it again, 10 to the minus 7. So the reason I've done that process is I've converted this into something that's got 10 to the minus 7, like so. Now that's very, very useful because once these are the same, we can just minus these numbers directly. That means the following. So we just simply do 5.6 minus, that used to be a point, 5.6 minus 
0 0.78 and then we do 10 to the power of uh, there we are, no wrong button, there we are, 10 to the power of minus 7. So the point of doing this is I can just do 5.6 minus 0 0.78 and then just keep this 10 to the minus 7 the same. So we just need to work out what 5.6 minus 0 0.78 is. Um, you can obviously use the uh, normal column subtraction but you'll again get this answer here, 4.82 times 10 to the power of minus 7. And that's our answer there. So that question is quite straightforward if you know that trick at the start. That we take one of these, it could be either, uh, if you take the second one it simplifies your task a little bit, and you times this by 10, divide that by 10, and you can go directly to the answer. Good, good. We're moving along nicely. Uh, that's, by the way, if you're looking for the topic on that. I'm going to move this out of the way. The topic is called standard form subtraction or addition. Addition works in exactly the same way as well. So if you need to look that topic up, that was what it would be called, standard form subtraction. Okay, this topic is dividing by that's how I spell correctly, dividing by a given ratio. Lots of practice on this. I do a lot of work in year seven and year eight on this particular topic. And it does come up, as you see, on a very rare occasion. So to do this, it's a straightforward dividing by ratio question. Imagine most of you are okay with this. But let me just run through. So first of all, we add the ratio together. So one plus five is equal to six. We're working over here. Then we take the 18 meters of the rope and we divide it by the number we just worked out, the six parts in total. So that means each part is worth three. And then we use that three and then take each part of the ratio in turn and times it by it. So we use the three, our magic number now, and we do three times one from here and three times five. So that gives us 15 for the last part of rope and then the first part of the rope is three. So our two answers are three and 15 meters. Straightforward question, no tricks to that one. Nice, easy two marks if you get that in a IGCSE exam. And moving on, we have a, what I like to call bread and butter question. This is solving linear inequalities. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they don't test you on quadratic inequalities. At least on Cambridge, uh, Edexcel they will. So if you're doing Edexcel IGCSE, you'll need to check that out. And the way we do this is we treat it like an equation. So we don't want to do anything uh, too crazy, but I don't think I've got a less than or equal to sign on my, uh, my keyboard, so I'll have to use uh, the normal symbol instead. So let me just write it down. So just be aware, right at the end, I'll write the answer with the greater than or equal symbol instead. But just for straight uh, simplicity, I'm going to write it like this. So our first step is to get all the x's on one side. Now, the way we do this is we add x to both sides. So we're going to plus x on both sides. So if we do that... Ah, don't want that. I want to get this, that's it. And if we add x on both sides, we're left with 3, because minus x plus x cancels. We still have our greater than symbol. 2x plus x is 3x, and then we have plus 15. Now, the next crucial step is we're going to flip over the equation. So that means, then, that we get 3x plus 15 is now less than... This is where the symbol comes in handy, is less than 3. So I've just flipped over the equation, and you have to flip over the inequality as well. And then, to go for our next step, we minus 15 from both sides, just like you do in a normal equation. That's supposed to be a 15. That's it. 
And if we do that, we get 3x is less than or equal to minus 12. And divide by 3x is less than or equal to minus 4. So our final answer is x is less than or equal to minus 4. Don't forget about flipping the inequality. That's what they're testing on in this kind of question. OK, moving on. So what have we got next? Ah, so this kind of question. It's in the title, actually. You can see it right there. This is called a relative frequency question. So if you want to do more work on this, this is under relative frequency, which is probably under the probability section of any course that you are doing. Don't forget the I. Like so. So Jamil has a by six-sided die. That's a dice. He rolls it 350 times, and the results are shown in the table. How many times he's getting each thing on the dice? And you want to find the relative frequency of getting a 2 with Jamil's dice or die. So the way we do that, well, we take the number that we're given. So you've got 50 of the 2s. And we divide it by the total number of times he rolled the dice, which is in the question, 350 times. And then you can simplify that. So 50 divided by 350. I don't know if you have to simplify for the uh, for the mark scheme, but you should get 1 over 7. So let me just check that. Question 11a. You should always check the mark scheme as you're going along. Make sure you're doing everything right. Yep, it accepts 50 over 350, or equivalent. That's what the OE stands for. And there's your answer as well. Uh, explain why your answer in part A is a good estimate of the probability of getting a 2. Well, you rolled it 350 times. So... You can put, um, like the mark scheme did, big sample size. Um, I would say large number of trials. That would be my answer. Uh, anything that indicates that he's rolled it a lot of times. And you're usually quite flexible how you explain that. Um, yeah, large sample or equivalent. So anything that means the same idea. Okay. And estimate the number of times... Jamil will get a 2 if he rolls the die 1,400 times. The way we do that is we take the relative frequency from part A, so that is 1 divided by 7, and then we multiply by the number of trials we want to do, which is 1,400, which on the surface looks like quite a tricky question, but remember, fractions of amounts divide by the bottom times by the top, so this is equivalent to... 1,400 divided by 7, which comes out very nicely at 200. So you expect it 200 times to roll a 2. Considering the probability is 1 out of 7, that makes kind of sense. So that's quite a nice probability question to get on the exam. I certainly wouldn't be too unhappy if I saw a question like that. OK, so far questions have been mostly straightforward, apart from 1 or 2. This is where it gets a little bit more tricky. And we are now coming on to trigonometry and the graph sketching. So if we're looking for what this topic would be under, it's trigonometry graph sketching without a calculator, without a GDC. So it's your basic knowledge of trigonometry, which is non-calculator, which some of you year nines might be a bit of a surprise, but actually you can do quite a lot of trigonometry without a calculator. Now the first thing we need to do is sketch the graph of y equals sine x between 0 and 360 degrees. Notice some degrees. And you should know that sine looks like a wave. Sine and cosine have a wave function that it looks like. So what happens is it goes up to here. And I'll try and do this as well as I can uh, on a computer. And then it comes down like so, and then goes round. Hopefully, it will fix it and comes around like so. Now that's not too bad. 
Um, it should be more of a curve going roundwards like this. Um, I don't know if I can change that now. But it should certainly become more outwards. But this is a basic sketch. Um, this here, this is important information you need to know for your scale, is that this is 1 up here. And likewise at the bottom, this is minus 1 here. So then that basically helps you. 0 0.5, I don't think this is strictly necessary, would be here. And then minus 0 0.5 will be here as well. And you're probably wondering, okay, what do these points correspond to? Well, it divides up into four neat parts. So down here, when it gets to one, it's at 90. And you do need to put these in for all your marks. This would be 180, where it crosses here. And then you can probably think that this is 270. For year 12, you probably know the unit circle. You can also describe it through that as well. But at IGCSE, we just talk about, this should reach, by the way, right down to the bottom. Yeah, that's it. At one, like so. Okay, so that's what you expect to do. One mark for the actual shape of the graph. So going up, down, and round like so. And then one mark for the different parts of the axes, so you know what's going on. Now, the point A, 0 0.5, is on the graph of y equals sine x. So what does that mean? Well, it's actually highlighting two specific points. So if you have a look at your diagram, once I can actually grab this, oh, there we are. So it's looking at this point here. I'll shrink it down slightly. You can probably see it better. So this point here, where it crosses at 0 0.5, and you can see it also crosses over here at 0 0.5 as well which I'll draw a quick circle. See if I can shrink it down slightly. And over here as well. So these two points is where it crosses at 0 0.5. Now, there should be one thing you're aware of before, and then you can use the graph then to help you with the other. So what the question is asking, essentially, is sine x is equal to 0 0.5, or 1 over 2. And from that, it wants you to at least work out one of these values that you should know off by heart. So if sine x is the half, then x is 30 degrees. You can use the uh, two triangles. Um, this one, you have to use the 2, 2, 2 triangle to actually know that by deriving it through a diagram. You can learn these off by heart. So this one must represent 30 degrees. So that's our first answer. And then to work out our second answer over here, well, it's a reflection, isn't it? So this part of the graph, it's a reflection with a line of symmetry at 90. Therefore, this point needs to be 180 minus 30, which then gives you 150. And, okay, this is not a calculated paper, but if you want to convince yourself of that, you can actually check that this is 150 by... Yeah, doing sine 150 should come out as a half. So that's a little bit of a tricky part there. You have to use your basic knowledge of sine and what it is. So sine x is the half, x is 30. Likewise, cos x is the half, x is 60. And then use the reflection of the graph to work out the other point here. So a little bit on the tricky side for that question there. Okay, now this question is a histogram question. So, first of all, it wants us to complete the histogram and then find the value of P. So, that's three marks in total. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, as you probably worked out already, this topic is called histograms. So, if you want more work on this, and with more detail, it's actually with unequal class widths. So, if you want to know more, oh, that's too far. And that's too too much. If you want to know more about this topic, this would be what's called under, under histograms with unequal class widths. Okay. Now the first thing it wants us to do is finish the histogram. Now it is two marks. 
Now, this is not a normal bar chart. If it was a normal bar chart and it said to finish it, then surely that would be one mark. So with two marks, there must be a bit more to it. And the key phrase to look for here is frequency density. Because that's what we're plotting. We're not plotting the frequency. We're plotting the frequency density. Now, for a bar that's 11 to 12, that's a bar of 1, well, it is the same thing. It is 38. But notice, if I take, for example, this one here, from 14 to 18, well, that's a length of 4, but it only goes up, well, not too far at all. Actually, it goes up 17 divided by 4, um, which is 3... Mm -hmm. Yeah, four and a quarter. So you can see it just goes up to 4.25 like so. So what we need to do is work out the frequency density. Then we can actually start working out how to plot our graph. So our bar is from 12 to 14. That's 2. Now to work out the frequency density, that's an important formula to remember. It's a bit small. Uh, can I increase that somehow? That quick question is probably. So let's make this 24. So frequency density is a formula you have to remember for the exam. Let's pop that over here. A bit wider. Okay, well that's equal to frequency divided by the class width. Now what the class width means is the distance between 12 and 14. So to work out our frequency density, which we need for the question, we need to do 24, our frequency, divided by the gap in between, which is 2. So that gives us the answer of 12. So that gives us 12. And let's increase the size of that slightly, like so. So the frequency density, which is what we need for the question, is actually 12. So when we draw our graph, we go 10, goes up in ones, so you can check the scale, but it goes up in ones, and then we draw a line like so, across there, and finally graph there. And if you wanted to, you could shade this in to give you your answer. So they're not going to give you marks for free. There has to be some kind of calculation before you draw the bar. And that should be your trigger in your mind to think to yourself, ah, OK, what's slightly different with the question? Ah, they've got frequency density. Ah, that means I need to change it into frequency density first. And the second part of the question, we need to find the value of P. So we're going to work in reverse, in effect. So if we look at our scale, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it goes 7 up. It goes 2 across. To work in reverse, we're going to multiply. So 7 times 2 will then give us our answer here. So 7 times 2, and that makes 14. So our answer for the last part is 14, because the area of the bar tells the frequency. That is 7 times 2 is equal to 14. So this will be 14, like so. One mark, again, it should be one calculation. OK, and our last two questions. Our first one is not a very nice one. It's a rearranging formula to make x the subject. Uh, this is called two different things. Um, I've seen it written two different ways. One, it could just be called rearranging formulae. That could be one name for it. It also could be called changing the subject. I use both of my lessons so in case they <laughs> mix it together here, which is rearrange the formula to make x the subject. So it can be called two different things. This is not a particularly nice question and you have to work through it quite steadily to get there. So let me write it down first of all. I'm using a computer so it's not going to look as pretty as if I was doing it by hand. Now bx plus c, and I'll put that in brackets which you'll see in a moment why. Okay, so that's our first step. Now the first thing to do is we're going to multiply both sides by the denominator. So we're going to multiply both sides by bx plus c. 
If we do that, we get y, open bracket, bx plus c, close bracket, space things out slightly, equals ax. So I've just multiplied by the denominator on both sides. That brings the bx plus c over to the y, and then we're left with just ax on this side. Okay, second step, we expand out the bracket. So we do it like we did in the previous question, I think question three. So we get y times bx is ybx. Uh, y times c is just yc. And then we get ax. So far, so normalish. We're just trying to simplify things out. Our next step is we bring all the x's to one side and we bring all the other stuff to the other side. So first of all, we'll do ybx equals ax minus yc. So I've literally just brought that uh, yc over to the other side. And then ax I put to the left hand side. So ybx minus ax equals minus yc. Now I've got too many negatives here, so I'm going to multiply everything by minus 1 so to flip the sign. So anything negative becomes positive, anything positive becomes negative. So we get ax minus ybx, and you'll thank me later, equals yc. Let's drag that up slightly. So ax minus ybx equals yc. Now this is the step that AA star students often forget to do, so a good thing to remember we're going to factorise into a single bracket for x. What that means is as follows. So we put x outside. What do you multiply x by to get ax? That's a. What do you multiply x by to get minus ybx? Minus yb. Let's space it out slightly. And then we leave the yc over here. And now finally, to get our final answer, we actually divide through now by that bracket we just came up with. So we get x equals yc divided, open brackets, a minus yb. And we're finished. There are different ways of writing the final answer. This is one possible way to avoid negatives, but you could have it with the negatives all flipped around as well. That would also be allowed too. So that's our final answer, yc divided by a minus yb. Good. Okay, everyone's favourite topic for the last, very last question. I wonder what, uh, what our mark scheme did here. Yeah, they flipped it around slightly. Yeah, they put the cy rather than yc. Yeah, but that's absolutely fine. Okay, question 15. I don't want this bar, I want this bar. There we are. Last question. Thanks for hanging in there. And of course, everyone's favourite topic, we are going to do some logarithms. And more to the point, we're just simplifying logarithms. And I've done two videos on this very, very recently. So I'd highly recommend you look at those before attempting this question yourself. Okay, now we want to solve this equation here, but we're not really solving, we're simplifying the left hand side to make it look like a single log, so log something. And then we can just write down the answer. So our first step is that we can take three of this log and bring it to the back. So we get then the following statement. Log two, remember, get two cubed now. So log two cubed minus, we're going to bring this two also to the front. So we get log 5, uh, there we are, squared. So I'm just fiddling around with the left hand side and then make it into a single log. And the first step in doing that is I brought 3 to the back and brought the 2 to the back. Now let's work these out. So log of 2 cubed, well that's log 8, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. And log 5 squared, well that's 5 times 5, so that's log 25. And my final log law I'm going to use 
Well, if the minus sign logs, that's the same as dividing these two numbers. So that then gives us log, I'll put this in brackets, 8 divided by 25. So this left-hand side is equal to this log, it's also equal to x, therefore these two numbers must be the same. So my answer is 8 divided by 25, or I think some people do it in decimals for some unknown reason, and you can actually write it as 0 0.32. 8 times 4 is 32. Uh, let's just check the mark scheme if they agree with doing that. Yep, some people do put 0 0.32 as well. That's fine. Okay, and the very last question. So solve log 4 to the base y is a third. Now the way to, we need to rewrite this as an exponential statement. What does that even mean? Well, our base number is y. So I write y. Our, um, there we are, that's the part I'm looking for. The power is a third. So y to the power of a third, which I write as one divided by three, is equal to this number four. So that's our first statement, y to the power of a third is 4. I'm just rewriting the log in terms of the power. Okay, so y to the power of a third means the same. Now I write this as in words, I think it makes it slightly clearer. So it means then the cube root of y, remember y to the power of a third is the same as the cube root of y is equal to 4. And then what's the opposite of a cube root? Well, it's actually cubing the number itself. So therefore, to get y on its own, we do y equals 4 to the power, not degrees, definitely not degrees, <laughs> 4 cubed. And then we work out what 4 times 4 times 4 is. We get 64. And that is our final answer y equals 64. And we finished the paper. So that is all the questions there. There's your answer, 64. And that is the last question on the paper. So I hope you found that interesting. Um, again, I'll upload this to my YouTube channel. For some of you year 11s out there, you might find this very, very useful. I won't go through it in class. I'll just get, refer you to the video instead. But all the notes are there. And also, crucially, I tell you, uh, the name of the topic in case you want to review that specific topic as well. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed the video and even if you're year 7, year 8, year 9, you might find this of interest as well to see where you're heading towards in your mathematics. Okay, bye bye for now.